The Crusades, a series of religiously motivated military campaigns launched from Latin Christian Europe in the High Middle Ages. During this period, many Crusades were waged, but which of these campaigns were successful and which were unsuccessful? Today on Real Crusades History, we'll investigate and seek out an answer to this question. Most people think of the Crusades as wars fought in the Holy Land. However, crusading happened in many other theaters as well. Crusades were waged by Christian kingdoms in Spain and Portugal against Moorish powers in Al-Andalus, that is, portions of the Iberian Peninsula conquered by Arabs and Berbers. The Northern Crusades were called to subdue and Christianize the Baltic. But in this video, we will be focusing on the Crusades in the Holy Land, specifically the so-called Numbered Crusades, the First Crusade, the Second Crusade, and so on. Let's start with the First Crusade. Called by Pope Urban II in 1095 and waged between 1096 and 1099. The First Crusade is a famously successful expedition, the culmination of the rising energy of the Latin West in the second half of the 11th century. Latin Christian armies swept into Syria Palestine and took Antioch, Jerusalem, and other important eastern cities. Though greatly outnumbered by their Muslim opponents, the First Crusaders achieved astounding success far from home. The Crusaders were aided by the divided state of the Eastern Muslim kingdoms, with various Seljuk princes warring with one another and against the Fatimids who ruled Egypt. The sharply honed martial abilities of the Western Knights also contributed crucially to the success. The Normans, fresh from victories over Anglo-Saxon England and Muslim Sicily, were the apex cavalry warriors of the era. The military genius of the First Crusade was Bohemond, a Norman with wide experience in Eastern warfare. Bohemond led the Crusaders to crushing victories over the Seljuk Turks at Dori Laim and Antioch, but the Crusade benefited from other great leaders as well, Godfrey of Bouillon, Baldwin of Bologna, Raymond IV of Toulouse, and Bohemond's nephew, Tancred. After the Crusade, these men remained in the East and settled in for the hard work of ruling and maintaining the Christian conquests in the Holy Land. The four Crusader states of the County of Edessa, the Principality of Antioch, the County of Tripoli, and the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Half a century later, one of these Crusader states, the County of Edessa, fell to the Zengid Turks in 1144. This prompted Pope Eugenius III to call for the Second Crusade, waged from 1147 to 1149. Two major Crusader armies set out to restore Edessa, one led by the King of France, Louis VII, and the other led by Conrad III, King of Germany. Louis and Conrad proved to be less than stellar commanders in the field. Separately, both the French and German forces suffered devastating defeats in battle against the Seljuk Turks while making the hard crossing through Asia Minor. By the time the two kings arrived in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, their forces were already seriously reduced and the Second Crusade ended in failure. Edessa was never recovered. But another more serious disaster was to follow. In 1187, Saladin, Sultan of Egypt and Syria, annihilated the army of the Kingdom of Jerusalem at the Battle of Hattin. This allowed Saladin to conquer nearly the whole of the Crusader Kingdom, with Jaffa, Arsuf, Acre, and Jerusalem all falling to the powerful Sultan. The Latin West reacted, and the Pope called for the Third Crusade, 1189-1192. First to set out was a large German army under the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick Barbarossa. Unlike his predecessor, Conrad III, Frederick proved highly capable as a general. Barbarossa successfully marched his army across the vast arid Asia Minor and utterly crushed the Seljuk Turks in a series of battles. However, despite this success in the field, the emperor died in an accident while his army forded a river. The German army was subsequently ravaged by plague in Antioch and never got a chance to take the fight to Saladin. But this was not the end of the Third Crusade. The King of England, Richard the Lionheart, led a much smaller army by sea to the Palestine Theater. Though his forces numbered less than half those of Saladin's, King Richard proved to be an outstanding general. The Crusaders recovered Acre, then the Lionheart defeated Saladin at the Battle of Arsuf. Richard recaptured important coastal cities like Caesarea, Arsuf, and Jaffa. 
When Saladin tried to retake Jaffa in 1192, Richard marched against him and defeated him in a final spectacular battle to close the crusade. Thus, Richard's crusade produced decisive, lasting successes, and yet many often view the crusade as a failure because Jerusalem was not recovered. But this is a misunderstanding. Richard, in fact, never attempted to recapture Jerusalem. Again, he was a capable commander and grasped the strategic reality of the situation. Given the small size of his army and the enormous forces at Saladin's disposal, Richard determined that it would be impossible to take Jerusalem since it lay far inland. Crucial to Richard's power was his fleet, which he used to supply his army. While fighting on the coast, Richard could defeat Saladin and hold territory. So while Richard didn't retake Jerusalem, he did restore important coastal portions of the kingdom. He also conquered the island of Cyprus for the kingdom, providing new, wealthy lands for the Crusaders. We can see that Richard's crusade was quite successful. Richard halted Saladin's war effort, restored the Christian kingdom in a new incarnation, and ensured that the Crusaders would continue to occupy territory in the Holy Land. Despite popular misconceptions about the results of the Third Crusade, historians have long pointed out the successes of the expedition. Thomas Madden says the Third Crusade was, by almost any measure, a highly successful expedition. Jonathan Riley Smith wrote that the Third Crusade's achievements were outstanding. Andrew Ehrenkreutz, who produced one of the most detailed biographies of Saladin, provides a very insightful assessment of the Third Crusade. In spite of overwhelming odds in their favor, the Muslims could neither outfight the Christian contingent nor simultaneously protect Ashkelon and Jerusalem. Considering the military organization and defense-oriented economy of the Muslim countries, and in view of the strategic advantages they secured in 1187-89, the terms of the 1192 armistice must be regarded as a humiliating concession the Christian invaders imposed on Islam. Despite the gains of the Third Crusade, the fact that Jerusalem remained in Muslim hands prompted Pope Innocent III to call for the Fourth Crusade, 1202-1204. Famously, the Fourth Crusade was diverted by the Venetians to the conquest of the Christian city of Constantinople. Once the Fourth Crusade was derailed, most of the men who'd signed up left in disgust before the major campaign even got underway, and the Pope excommunicated the expedition's participants for attacking fellow Christians. The Fourth Crusade shows how power politics could play a role in subverting a crusade. It goes without saying that the campaign as a crusade was a failure. According to the understanding of Latin Christians during this period, men who were excommunicate could not crusade, and thus, once the Fourth Crusaders set off against Christian lands, they were, in the eyes of the Church, no longer crusaders, but renegades engaged in a sinful, unjust war. The ignoble results of the Fourth Crusade prompted the Pope to try and take more direct control over the next crusade, the Fifth Crusade, 1217-1221. The Pope appointed a churchman, Cardinal Pelagius, as overall commander of the Crusade. As a target for the campaign, Pelagius selected Egypt. Years earlier, Richard the Lionheart had suggested that Egypt, as a key Muslim power center, needed to be subdued before the Christians could securely hold Jerusalem. The Fifth Crusade would attempt to gain Egypt for Christendom once and for all. The overall military leader of the Fifth Crusade was supposed to be the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick II. Frederick never arrived, and instead a rather motley assortment of German, Hungarian, Flemish, and French contingents campaigned under the Cardinal. The Fifth Crusade was outnumbered by its Muslim opponents, and suffered from somewhat disjointed and inconsistent leadership. On a number of important occasions, Pelagius failed to heed sound advice from his most competent advisors. However, the Fifth Crusade made remarkable progress in its Nile campaign, and indeed came close to capturing Egypt. However, the Muslims ultimately achieved total victory in the conflict, and the Christian invasion was repelled. For failing to live up to his crusader's vow, Emperor Frederick II was excommunicated by the Pope. When Frederick finally did launch his own small crusade in 1228, the so-called Sixth Crusade, he was still excommunicate. As in the case of the Fourth Crusade, from the perspective of the medieval church, this was not a valid crusade. Frederick's lack of legitimacy as a leader of holy war no doubt contributed to the extremely small size of his army. When he arrived in Palestine, the emperor didn't have the numbers to effect any military conquests. 
He negotiated with the Sultan of Egypt, al Kamil, and supposedly secured the surrender of Jerusalem by the Muslims in 1229. Frederick's treaty with al Kamil has led many to regard the Sixth Crusade as a bloodless success, but in truth, the recovery of Jerusalem was little more than fraud. According to the terms, the Crusaders were not allowed to restore Jerusalem's defenses, and the Muslims maintained hold over the Temple Mount. al Kamil defended his treaty to the Muslim world by pointing out that the Christian hold over the Holy City was entirely ephemeral, and once the treaty had expired, he would easily snatch Jerusalem back up again. The Knights Templar, the barons of the Crusader Kingdom, and the Church agreed. They refused to move their capital from Acre to Jerusalem. As predicted, Jerusalem fell easily to the Turks in 1244. Frederick's recovery of Jerusalem had proved to be ultimately ineffective. Plus, Frederick's activities weakened rather than strengthened the Crusader states. Unlike Richard the Lionheart, who worked with the Templars and the local barons of the Crusader states to effect victory and recovery, Frederick ignored the kingdom's laws and treated the Crusader territory like his personal possession. This led to a war between the Crusader states and Frederick's imperial forces, the War of the Lombards, which dragged on from 1228 to 1243. The Sixth Crusade was not only a farcical event, it was damaging to the long-term good of the Crusader kingdom. This second loss of Jerusalem prompted the Seventh Crusade, 1248 to 1254. This crusade had coherent and highly respected leadership under Louis IX, King of France. A very pious man, Louis was widely admired throughout Christendom and is today recognized as a saint by the Catholic Church. Like the Fifth Crusade, Louis's crusade targeted Egypt. Louis's army was well organized, though greatly outnumbered. Louis led a force of no more than 15,000 men, and this against the full power of Ayyubid Muslim Egypt and Syria. Although Louis experienced some early successes, his forces were crushed at the Battle of Mansoura in 1250. The Seventh Crusade ended in total defeat. Though he was courageous, Louis was often slow to react during critical moments of the war, and this hesitant leadership resulted in his army being bogged down. Although his first crusade failed, Louis tried again some years later. He organized the Eighth Crusade in 1270, this time targeting Tunisia in North Africa. But as soon as Louis's army landed, the king himself fell desperately ill and died. Thus, the Eighth Crusade failed before it really began. The final crusade that sometimes receives a number is the Ninth Crusade, a very minor campaign led by Prince Edward of England between 1271 and 1272. Edward's army was quite small, containing around 1,000 men. He lacked the men to conduct any major campaigns, but he was able to secure a 10-year peace with Baibars, the powerful Sultan of Egypt who'd recently conquered several important cities in the Christian kingdom. Edward's crusade, then, may have bought the local Christians some time, but it achieved no great victories. Looking back over the major campaigns of the Holy Land Crusades, the so-called Numbered Crusades, we can see many important defeats with a few interesting and outstanding victories. The major defeats all occurred mainly as a result of less than stellar leadership. The First Crusade and the Third Crusade stand out to us as impressive triumphs resulting from outstanding leadership. When well-led, even small crusader armies showed themselves capable of beating far larger enemy forces. In the highly dangerous, fast-paced circumstances of crusader warfare, decisive, competent leadership was absolutely essential. Bowman and Richard the Lionheart stand out to us as the most gifted commanders covered in this video. Both leaders held their men together in highly precarious circumstances and managed to inflict decisive defeats on far larger Saracen armies. The First Crusade and the Third Crusade both achieved long-term results as well, securing territory for the Christians in Syria-Palestine. But it's also important to recognize the larger implications of this long period of Crusader warfare in the Holy Land. The very fact that Latin Christendom was projecting power in the distant Eastern Levant was the sign of its surging vitality and strength. During the ages of Charlemagne or Alfred the Great, the West could not have launched overseas campaigns to the faraway Holy Land, much less hold territory in this region long term. 
The early Middle Ages had been a period of Islamic hegemony in the Mediterranean world, but the Crusades were a sign that that had changed. The Latin West was now a great power in the Mediterranean and successfully pushed back the influence of the great Muslim kingdoms as well as the Byzantine Empire. The Zengids and the Ayyubids and the Mamluks won many important wars in Syria and Egypt during the Crusades, but the very fact that they now had to fight the Latin Christians right in the heart of the Islamic world was a sign that Latin Europe had become a great power.